You might notice a new addition to the Gamer Heaven. Let me zoom in for you. Yeah, that's a PS5. And you're thinking, Kevin, you already have one of those bad boys in the living room. You've had it for almost a year. Well, now I have not one, but two. So in the first part of this video, I'm going to try and justify to myself in the gaming community why I own two PS5s. Then I'm going to proclaim that people that say spray painting doesn't look good have no idea what they're doing. And I'm going to walk you guys through how to spray paint plastic components, whether that's controllers, PC cases, PS5 flaps. Then I'm going to grease up the hooves of all the stallions and stallionettes in the stable and sign off. Let's get it. First of all, Kevin, you sick son of a bitch. Why do you need two PS5s? Well, first of all, I didn't actively seek out this PS5. It was kind of just dropped into my lap, kind of like my other PS5. These are both from the Navy Exchange, just on my lunch break, going in there to maybe get a Subway sandwich, look at some TVs and some headsets. And the little lady that works behind the counter says, honey, honey, we have PlayStation 5s in. And when you get a PS5 begging to be purchased by you, especially when it is under MSRP, $480, not $500 like out in town, and it's tax free, you don't say no. I'm not scalping this thing or doing any nefarious shit with it. I'm actually gonna be using both of these PS5s. One of them is AK-40 Kevin's, one is the Gamer Heaven's. One is my personal console for casual co-op play in the living room and whatnot. One of them is gonna stay in this room and be specifically for when products get sent out, such as side plates, NVMe SSDs, and eventually one of these is getting fully customized with an overclocked APU and a water cooling loop. And there's a good chance that I screw up and completely destroy PS5. I don't wanna be PS5-less, so it's good that I have a backup. Not to mention the one that is for Gamer Heaven, i.e. doesn't leave this room, is going to be connected to my PC via a capture card so I can play PlayStation 5 exclusives and actually stream or screen record them for YouTube videos. If it sounds like I'm trying to justify buying two PS5s, it's cause I am. One year after launch of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and X, a lot of consumers, a lot of gamers, still can't get their hands on these bad boys. I will say I didn't take this out of the hands of a child for Christmas or anything like that. So unless somebody had base access, i.e. a military ID or was a dependent, and again, I wasn't planning on buying this bad boy. I just went in my lunch break and the little lady called me over. She basically forced the damn thing on me. You know what I'm saying? But also from a content standpoint, there's a couple of, uh, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but little witty videos that I'm gonna do with two PS5s. Awkward flexes and stuff. Ugh, I mean, stretch first. You gotta make sure that you're limbered up before you unbox a PS5 because you will pull a hammy from excitement. Now, this is very interesting to be unboxing this console again. You can fuck off. Oh my God, I'm holding a PlayStation 5 right now. I need to take just a minute. I, this, this, uh, I am, I haven't been this excited to unbox or unwrap something in such a long time. This being so sought after and so hard to get. For one, I already know what's in the box now, but this is a very, very hyped up consumer good, a very um, sought after piece of electronics gear. So it's still exciting to unbox. I'm still stimulated right now. I see, I see, I, rem I remember, it's all coming back now. You have a good little grab handle here. This is a security mechanism. So on your way to the parking lot, you most likely will get jumped. So you can actually use this to swing the box around to fight off the crowds. Show me what you got. Show me what you're working with. So this top box right here has your accessories. I believe there's a uh, DualSense controller in there. Now, when you buy a DualSense controller, like an extra one, whether you get the Cosmic Red or the uh, Satin Black, it doesn't come with a USB-C cable. So you're gonna need to keep the one that comes with the PlayStation 5. There she is. Hey, baby, aren't you a bad girl? Not the most premium packaging. You just got some little eggshell carton here. You know, for a $500 flagship console, you would expect it to have some nice laser cut foam or something, but none of the new consoles have that from what I've seen thus far from unboxing the Switch OLED, the Series S. Um, I've been there for two Series X unboxings and, and the packaging is just like, here you go. Here's your, here's your flagship console. All right, so she's a little bit dirty, just like the first one was. There's a little bit of a uh, residue here on the piano black section, se section? Right here on the piano black section. Now I will say this is gonna get fully customized. Neither one of the PS5s are gonna look stock whatsoever. And eventually this probably is the one that is going to get uh, like a custom case and water cooled and overclocked APU and a bunch of other bullshit that's like really uh, intense. Honey darling, you got your quick start guide. I don't know how to read, so I'm gonna go ahead and discard that. You have a safety guide here telling you not to use your PS5 like a Frisbee, not to choke out your significant other with the power cord or anything like that. Uh, you have a DualSense controller over here, which is simply a technological 
Technological Marvel. I've already talked about the DualSense extensively, but basically you have haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, and a built-in microphone. Three features never seen in a, in a uh, controller before. All right, now this is the stand. It is required to use this, whether you're vertical or horizontal. Um, because you will get better cooling from your PS5, not to mention, well, Sony says to use it, so it's probably for a reason. You have an HDMI 2.1 cable here. You will need to use a high-speed HDMI 2.1 cable and have a TV that is uh, capable for that technology to make sure that you can utilize 4K 120. Granted, very, very few titles are currently utilizing 4K 120. Most next-gen games that we've seen thus far have been 4K 60. And here's your USB-C cable for pairing and charging your DualSense. I've got to say, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned this before, but I'm more of a fan of how you pair a controller to an Xbox One or Series by pressing the sync button on the top and then pressing the sync button on the console instead of having to grab yourself a cable and then plug it in you know tether to the front of a ps4 or 5 i think microsoft's pairing method for controllers is better not to mention it is a better wireless means of data transfer because xbox uses a dedicated 2.4 gigahertz wireless connection playstation uses bluetooth 5.0 which is less than ideal generally bluetooth is a kind of slow means of wireless connectivity but I will say, however they utilize it with the black magic that they work on the operating system, it actually does feel very fluid and I've never noticed any kind of input lag or delay playing on a PS4 or 5. I'm gonna be shooting some B-roll right now, but basically you've got little PlayStation face buttons on the inside of the flaps or side panels. You also have some face buttons right here. You have two USB 3.0 ports in the back. You have a ethernet port, which is rated for gigabit. Uh, you have an HDMI 2.1 slot, and then you have your AC adapter plug. You do also have some fins or vents in the back for cooling, and those do extend all the way around the top of the console. You have a USB-C 3.0 port in the front, as well as another USB, I think this one is a 2.0. You do have your disc eject, if you're not on the digital only console, and a power button right here. I personally advise against the digital only console. I have made an entire video about it in the past, but just to summarize, there's a class action lawsuit against Sony because they are charging 30 to 60% more for games than buying a digital code to redeem in the store or a disc. And as of late 2018, the only place to buy digital games for a PlayStation 4 or 5, and well, there's a whole digital only console now, um, is from the PlayStation Network. You no longer can redeem codes that you got on like Amazon or Walmart or anything like that. So that is why there's a class action lawsuit. There's also one for thumbstick modules on the DualSense because Sony went with the same company Nintendo goes with for their Joy-Cons. And those are notorious for having savage stick drift. I know a little off topic for unboxing a PS5, but just good to know uh, who you're getting into bed with. You know what stallions and stallionettes, this bad boy is looking a little bit stock. It needs to be customized. So I'm gonna do the only logical thing here. I'm a, I'm a spray painter. Now the hardest part of this entire process is gonna be getting these side panels off because the first time you remove them, and this is obviously a brand new console, it's in there pretty good. Now I have installed two different NVMe SSDs onto the other PlayStation 5 and taken the panels off to put on uh, like a vinyl wrap. So those are a lot easier to get on and off, but this is gonna be a little bit of a biatch with cheese. We're gonna talk a little bit about spray painting too. There's a lot of uh, haters out there that think rattle cannons uh, ghetto or uh, doesn't look good. If you do it correctly, it actually looks great. The only real negative con there would be for the first week or so you had that smell of, of paint. So I'm not sure if they revised the design of the PS5 or what, considering I got my original one about eight months ago, but these side panels legitimately were a lot easier to get off. I'm gonna edit in a quick clip right here showing you how to get these panels off. Let's just yank it off and then make it look real easy in the video. So what you're gonna do with your left hand, you're gonna put a little bit of pressure right here on the bottom left where the AC adapter is, the power plug. And then with the uh, your right hand, you're gonna put pressure on the top right here and peel and you are gonna hear, hear a little bit of a snap or pop. Welcome back. I didn't go anywhere, but you sure did. We're gonna paint these bad boys. See you in the garage. I can't snap with that finger. This one I can though. Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Come on over. Bring it in, come on. All right, Stein, so first things first, sorry about the audio quality. Who would have thought that a non-acoustically treated garage would sound like booty butt cheeks? First thing I wanna do is make sure I don't destroy my workstation more than it already is. Step one. Cardboard your workstation. Step two, move your vehicle out of the garage so you don't get overspray. Guess what? We're using black paint. Guess what else? This is a black car. I don't care about the overspray. Plus, it's gonna be pretty well contained. The spritz pattern is gonna be 
in this direction over here. Now, the people that complain about spray painting or say it doesn't look very good, don't know what they're doing. There are three key takeaways to make sure that your spray paint job actually looks good. The first one is prepping the surface. You do not need to sand this. This is already rough and porous. Two, you wanna make sure you use the right paint for the right job, i.e. since this is plastic, you wanna make sure that it says on the can that it does bond to plastic. Also, I would recommend doing a paint and primer mix. That way you don't need to do two to three coats of a primer then two to three coats of your base, your color. And then the third and final thing is you wanna make sure that you use some kind of a sealant or a clear coat at the end. And what that's gonna do is it is going to protect and it's also going to give you the finish that you want, whether you want a glossy reflective surface or you want a flat slash matte look. So again, if you prep the surface correctly, that means making sure that it's sanded if that's required, taping everything off with masking tape that you don't want painted, and then you use the right paint for the job four to six inches away in a fanning pattern after shaking the can for 60 seconds. This sounds way more complicated than it really is. I'm gonna walk you guys through it. And then use some kind of a sealant, which is overkill. I would use a clear coat, which I have two of them over here. We've got gloss and we've got matte. Now I'm gonna go with matte. I think matte is going to look really good with a nice flat black panel. So I'm either gonna go with this flat black or as you can see, I have a lot of paints up here. I used to build custom controllers, pictures on screen here, and I would hydro dip and I would also spray paint. I did actually use a pneumatic, i.e. air powered spray gun for a while, and I was getting the same results for like six times the price as when I was just spray painting. This dark gloss gray over here would look pretty sick. You wanna make sure you shake your can for at least 60 seconds. You wanna hear that ball bearing rattling around in there, especially if it is a paint and primer like this, because there's a lot of different chemicals that need to be mixed up in there. Be thorough with it. Now, other than protecting your workstation or your desk from overspray, putting your uh, putting your item that you're painting on something like a piece of cardboard is actually good because instead of having to move yourself around whatever you're painting, you can actually move it to you. So when I need to hit this side over here, I can literally just rotate this around and hit the other side. You wanna work smarter, not harder. You don't wanna move yourself around the item. You want the item to move around you. I also do recommend using a respirator and latex gloves. These will be linked in the description below. Now you can get something like a reusable respirator that has filters that pop on and off, or, or you can just get yourself a paper disposable like that. A pack of these is dirt cheap. These will also be linked in the description below. Um, I do also recommend uh, opening up your garage or if you're painting indoors, maybe cracking a window. And latex gloves, these are optional, but you don't wanna get a bunch of paint on your hands. It takes forever to get off. <laughs> That's what she said. Just kidding, I've got no stamina. All right, this thing smells like it's been living under the railroad tracks. It smells like wet dog. It smells like Chewbacca's knuckles. It smells like the content a lot of YouTubers push. Stinky. All right, so I decided we're gonna go with the gray here. No, 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 maybe the black. I don't know, what do you guys think? Oh boy, oh jeez, Rick. Oh, I'm torn here. The black and the gray would both look pretty sick. Two hand technique, turn and butter like a Amish. Shake weight. If you don't feel like you're getting tinnitus in your elbow, you're not shaking this can hard enough. Now you wanna make sure you do a little test spray for two reasons. One, you wanna purge any air bubbles out of the line because if you get that on your first spray, it's gonna look like crap and you're gonna end up having to sand the surface and repaint it. And the second one would be when you do that little initial purge, it kind of clears up the tip, the urethra, if you will, of the can. Urethra Franklin. All right, so you wanna be four to six inches away from the surface and go in a light fanning pattern back and forth. So with your first coat, you don't have to get full coverage. As you can see, there's still the base color, which is white bleeding through there. That's completely fine. Basically the first layer or first coat, what you wanna do is make sure that you get a chemical bond. And then from there, the next two to three coats of your base or color is going to give full coverage of the new color, which in this case is matte black. And then we're gonna do two to three coats of a clear, which again, we're gonna go with a flat matte. So when you get a PS5, you have to use the stand. It is recommended by Sony. By recommended, I mean it says you need to use it. That's for two reasons, but the main primary one is for cooling because by getting it up off the ground, especially if you have it inside of a tight entertainment center, you're actually able to uh, not block the intake and exhaust fans, which is pretty sweet. So if you are gonna be mounting your PS5 horizontally or on its side, it's this is just held on by friction. It clips on. If you're gonna mount it vertically, which we are with this bad boy over here, you rotate this around and it reveals a screw inside of here. And this is actually the newer PS5 model. The dead giveaway is that the screw can now be hand tightened as opposed to the current PS5, which I've owned for almost 10 months now, that you have to use a flathead screwdriver with. Now this one does have a slot for a flathead, but it also has a little plastic tip, if you will, where you can hand screw this bad boy in. So 
that's really cool. In case you're wondering where the PlayStation logo decals and the LED RGB kit came from, those are linked in the description below, as well as a link to a video where I did install some parts from Extreme Rate slash Play Vital. They're kind of the same company. And there will be a ton of content right here on this channel with both of the PS5s in the very near future. If this video stimulated you down there in the game or nether regions, go ahead and like the video. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, as well as tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing and honest gaming peripheral reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, chairs, mics, etc. And I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.